Well, hello, hello, Refuge family. It's the 28th of April, and this would be our 32nd fireside chat, if I did the math correctly. So I'm um, very glad um, that these are available for you, praying that they encourage you, and, and so glad you're tuning in, you know, that you're watching these, most of you live and some uh, checking them out after the fact. But uh, again, today is the 28th, so if you watch this at a latter date, um, you can correlate that with what's going on, which is still the COVID-19 crazy crisis. And um, we're going to be hearing from Pastor Chase in just a moment, uh, and we'll transfer over to, to his home, as it were, for you to hear that chat, so you get a little flavor for that uh, today. But I want to pray before we do, and um, just reading in, in Timothy today about praying for our government leaders, uh, as Paul instructed Timothy to to tell his congregation, so he's telling ours. So let's let's do that now. All right, Father, thank you. Uh, just as your word says, to, to thank you for those in in those positions of authority, um, Lord, even those that perhaps we may not agree with, uh, but Lord, we are told uh, to pray for them, and we do. Father, we pray uh, for the governor of our state. Um, Lord, so much input coming into him and trying to decipher all that, making the right decision uh, for, for the whole state. It's, it's tough. Lord, we pray for wisdom from above. Lord, you've heard us pray for that before. We pray again today uh, for your wisdom, Lord, for him to hear your wisdom and follow that kind of wisdom, Father, during this time. Lord, I pray as well uh, for our refuge family that are tuning in to this chat, Lord, that you'd bless them and that you'd encourage them uh, through this word from Pastor Chase. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, well, let's, uh, let's listen in. Hey, Refuge family. I'm so glad that you're joining us. Um, I'm excited to be able to get into the word with you this afternoon. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to James chapter 1. And as you guys are turning there, let me ask you a question. So when things go wrong or things don't go the way that you plan, how do you usually respond or receive it? Um, and I could say it pretty confidently, uh, I think, and I think my bride would agree that when it comes to those questions for me, I don't usually do very well. <laughs> um, it's sad to say, and so I'm not boasting in this. This is, in fact, something that I feel like the Lord is actually working on me in. Um, but just for a little context, um, let me share maybe the reason why. So um, by nature, I am very much a, a structured person. I, I love consistency. I love um, rhythms. I, I, I love uh, time management. You could say that it's almost a, a love language for me as I have uh, most of my days kind of set up in different time segments so I can I just have a maximum focus and maybe intent in those times. Uh, and so um, that's kind of the hope for each day. And yet... As you all know, um, things don't always go the way that we plan. Um, as um, disruptions happen, as accidents happen, as challenges happen, as uh, things pop up, or even trials happen. And so usually when those things happen, I wish I could say I do well, but the process usually looks something like this. Uh, usually it looks like me getting quiet for a little bit, um, just out of... Uh, bother and then uh, after getting quiet then I will wallow for a little bit uh, in annoyance and then um, at that point the Lord will usually use my wife um, to be able to ask me hey what is going on and from there share a just some truths from um, just God's word to be able to help renew my perspective and at that point by the grace of God usually I'll come to um, I, I think a uh, a more Jesus-centered perspective uh, as the Lord just graciously uses my wife. But in this season, um, I bring this up because we are all in some ways going through a disruption. We are all going through something that none of us had planned for, none of us signed up for, um, but that affects all of us. Um, whether you are young or you're old, whether you are rich, whether you're poor, if you're an introvert, extrovert, um, all of us are affected in some way here that um, 
all of us, maybe to differing degrees, maybe to uh, in various ways, and yet as I talk to people, there's not one person that I know who's been untouched by this pandemic and this season. So um, similarly, how the Lord uses uh, my bride to speak truths to encourage my soul uh, at the time frames when I'm challenged, uh, I hope he uses me to do the same uh, with you guys as I get a chance to share God's word with you. So um, James chapter one, starting in verse two says, consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect, so that you might be mature and complete, lacking nothing. So just for a little bit of context of who James is speaking to, is he's speaking to dispersed believers at this time frame. Uh, many who had probably lost their homes, many who had been through just some types of uh, oppression, uh, others who have uh, suffered loss maybe of uh, of loved ones through persecution, um, others who maybe have been socially oppressed, uh, others still who maybe have felt mistreated uh, within the church context, um, and then others who were, uh, again, not only going through those things, but had been through those things. And to them, he says, count it all joy when you fall into these various trials. Now, the question is, is can James really mean that too? these people who are going through these things? And the answer is yes. Now, that might surprise most of us, as um, most of us have a hard time being happy when everything is good, right? I, I think about uh, things that bring joy for most of us. None of us would say trials, maybe uh, yeah, being with family, uh, uh, reading a good book, um, going and seeing uh, the ocean, right? Um, being outdoors, like, man, just listen to good music. Like, these are things that maybe are on uh, just your joy uh, lists, um, but trials, no matter who you are, I don't think you usually will find that one. And yet, that is what James is calling us to, is to find joy in the midst of these trials. So, is James some type of masochistic person, or is he saying something that maybe we are missing? So let's read on. So it says, Consider it great joy, as my brothers and sisters, when you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you might be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. As we read this, James, we see that James is not saying to take joy in the trial, but he's saying to take joy in the midst of the trial because of what the Lord is going to produce through it. Of the fact that the Lord is at work, even as you're going through this process, for the purpose of something that he desires. So, um, J. Vernon McGee once said, Trials are meaningless, suffering is senseless, and testing is a waste of time unless there's some good purpose for them. And we're actually told here in the text of the purposes that God means as he uh, allows us to go through these testings, as he allows us to go through these trials. Uh, we see that trials produce endurance, and endurance produces maturity. Or to be grown up and no longer a child in the faith, right? He wants us to grow into more and more becoming the person that God has called us to be. Now, um, we don't have time to get into what it means to be spiritually mature, but I think about the words of Jesus in Luke 6. He says that, um, just to paraphrase, he says something to the tune of a disciple, when they are full grown, they will be like their master. So there's this purposing as followers of Jesus that we would become more like Jesus, right? Uh, Romans 8, 29 says that uh, one of God's great purposes is to conform us to be more like Jesus. Uh, this is called the process of sanctification or um, the process of becoming more like Jesus. And one of the great means that God uses to do this is often the challenges that we have in this life. So with that in mind, uh, D.A. Carson, who's a scholar, points out that this is not a perverse form of Christian masochism, but an entirely appropriate response if we remember the Christian's goals. If our highest goal is creature comforts, this passage is incomprehensible. 
If our highest goal includes growth in Christian character, James' evaluation makes imminent sense. So with that being said, in light of our present circumstances, how are we dealing with or how are we going to deal with our own trials? Um, and, you know, in the beginning I mentioned that there is these various things that were going on for the hearer uh, of this letter as James wrote it, right? Um, but what's interesting is that James purposely does not use a specific example of what that trial looks like. He says various trials. So the idea could be multiple things. I think he does that very specifically because, man, there was lots of different things going on at that time frame. And yet through whatever they were going through, God was actually using it to shape his people. Similarly, there are many things that I know that brothers and sisters are going through in this season. I know that there's people who are going through relational turmoil, others who are maybe going through depression or loneliness, uh, others who have lost jobs, others who are sick, others who um, maybe have um, just been having such a challenge uh, being indoors, whatever it might be, all of us, again, have gone through things in this season that have been hard. And yet, brothers and sisters cling to the fact that God is using and will use it, um, if we allow him to, uh, to shape us to be more like his son, Jesus. As he desires to shape you, he desires to, to make you more like Jesus in this time frame. But we have to continue to cling to him through it. And the hard thing is, is we don't always have this perspective. In fact, as we go through trials, um, I believe we actually have to make a choice, right? And, and I think these two choices kind of come, uh, or I guess these two choices, two choices can be just summed up in two W words. So when it comes to trials, I believe we can either, number one, wallow, which is basically, um, why do we have to go through this? I don't deserve this. Uh, my life is horrible. Things will never get better. My life has now been ruined. My life will never be the same. I've just lost all hope. Or secondly, we can be a witness. And what I mean by that is, as we trust the fact that God is in control, that he's using this to shape us, there is a peace that comes from that. There's a peace that surpasses all understanding that, that guards our hearts as we trust that the God who is infinite is in control and is using this to shape our hearts to make us more like him. Um, and in that, um, in a time frame when people are wallowing and hurting and wondering, looking for peace, as people who have been touched by the peace of God, we have an opportunity there to be able to share about what God has done in our lives. So there's opportunity for witness. But as we close, and as I encourage you guys to trust God in this way, um, I want to just kind of go through a quick list of what I don't mean. This does not mean don't be in touch with reality. If things are hard, you don't have to pretend like it's not challenging. This doesn't mean it's not okay to grieve. In fact, through his trials, David grieves, uh, Jesus grieves uh, before he goes to the cross. So this isn't a call to be stoic or anti-emotional. Uh, anti-emotional um, in uh, First Thessalonians, um, you know, and I think it's First Thessalonians four. Paul says that though we mourn, we don't mourn like those who have no hope. So I think it's okay to mourn, but the key is to remember that there is hope. This doesn't mean that we don't feel. Um, there are times in the season where, man, I feel full of faith, full of trust. And other times, as a husband and father, I get scared for the future. I, I think about, okay, what, what kind of world is, is my kids going to grow up in? And yet, um, like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, who brought these things before the, the Father, as he said, is there any other way? He says, but not my will, but your will be done. So I'm saying it's okay to have these different emotions and these things that are going on inside of us, and yet we don't allow them to override our faith in the God who is faithful, who was and is and is to come, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And allow that faith to be what we trust, or allow the faith in Him to be what guides us and directs us as we trust Him. So guys, I want to... 
Oh, and then lastly, this is not a call to do this on your own. Um, brothers and sisters, come alongside one another and pray for each other. But also cling to the fact that God promises to never leave you nor forsake you. There's no height nor depth nor angels nor demons nor principalities nor powers nor things seen or unseen that can ever separate you from his love uh, in Christ Jesus. And so I want to finish by just sharing this quote with you from Warren Wiersbe. He says that Christians are kind of like tea bags. You get to see what they're made out of when they're put in hot water. So family, we've been given this amazing promise from our God. But the choice for perspective and what we cling to in this season, I believe, is ours. And so, brothers and sisters, let's choose well. God bless you.